And today, Jim Hare is our reviewer, and he's going to be doing a review of the mysterious case of Rudolph Diesel by Douglas Brunt. And we know Jim Hare, a former Elmira teacher, American history and government, as well as the former city of Elmira mayor and councilman. And he writes a monthly Elmira history column for the Star Gazette. And he's co-published multiple books on Elmira. So without delay, is that now? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, in some places, they just get up and say, uh, Jim Hare, the old gray mayor, is. Uh, <laughs> so I appreciate all of that. <laughs> and I appreciate you all turning out. Uh, this, this was an interesting book. I see Martha Horton. Your mysteries have been, inter uh, been attracting my attention a lot lately. Uh, the Adventures of Alex and Nan, written by Martha and, uh, uh, and Alan, and uh, Tony Pucci's books. Uh, so we have our local writers, and I must say I've been caught up with James Patterson's books. Uh, and uh, but and his read fast because they're short chapters and they're only about two and a half page chapters, so you have a blank half page so you can zip through the book. Right there. <laughs> but uh, let me start out with a little jeopardy. Can anybody answer that? Wow. Final question. What is an ice cube? What is an ice cube? Okay. Yeah. Jeopardy? What is a diesel? A diesel engine. Okay. <laughs> And who is Rudolph Diesel? Very good, very good. As I mentioned about uh, reading, I'm normally a reader of nonfiction, and uh, I, as I said, I've tried to break away and to get into other things, and I've been reading so many of these mystery novels, I thought, gee, maybe it's time I get back to nonfiction. And they, some, there was a review of the book the Mysterious Case of Rudolph Diesel. And uh, it's a, an interesting book to read. And I, I've been really sorting out how to describe it. Uh, I'm a bit challenged reading it because in ninth grade I took a Cooter vocational test. And I find, found out that I had a 93% interest in clerical and computational things and a 35% interest in mechanical. So reading about diesel engines was really a challenge. And I will have to say, you learn a lot about diesel engines. Uh, I think I probably read a little faster through those sections. You also learn a lot about John D. Rockefeller. And you learn a lot about Kaiser Wilhelm II. And you learn a lot about Winston Churchill. So in the process of reading about Rudolf Diesel, you're educated with, about these folks who played a very important role in his story. I'm going to read a little bit from the prologue of the book. October 11th, 1913. There was something in the water. Crew members of the Dutch pilot steamer Kortzen approached the object that had caught their attention. There, near the mouth of the Scheldt River, along the eastern edge of the English Channel, in the rippling black, the men in, on the small vessel realized what they'd seen. It was a body. Though the decomposition was ghastly, the sailors noticed the fine quality of the clothing, 
that still wrapped the body. Pulling the remains alongside the boat, they plucked four items from the pockets of the deceased before releasing the rotting corpse back into the waves. A coin, a purse, a pen knife, an eyeglass case, and an enameled pillbox. The steamer then made its scheduled call to the Dutch port of a Dutch word, <laughs> where the crew reported the discovery and turned over the items. Harbor officials immediately wondered if the report from the Kortzen could be connected to the missing person case that had been in the headlines of newspapers in every major city in Europe and America. Officials sent word to the missing man's son, who arrived in that city from Germany the next day. As soon as he saw the items, Eugen Diesel confirmed that they belonged to his father, Rudolf. The mysterious case of Rudolf Diesel is what happened? Let's see. Did he fall off? He was on the ship, and on September 29th, he disappeared. He disappeared. And did he fall off the ship? Was he pushed off the ship? Did he jump off the ship? What happened? And so the book tells that story. Now, who was Rudolf Diesel? He was the second, second of three children of Elise and Theodore Diesel. He was born in Paris in 1858. His parents were from Bavaria, now living in Paris. His family suffered from financial difficulties, and during the Franco-Prussian War, the family went to London. And before the war ended, Rudolf was sent to Augsburg in Bavaria to live with his uncle. At age 14, he wrote to his parents that he wanted to become an engineer. He was an outstanding student, and he came under the influence of Karl von Linde. And Linde, in 1872, had designed a concept for mechanical refrigeration. And that would eliminate the need for ice to be hauled from frozen ponds and lakes, and then stored in ice houses. Customers of Lynn's machines use the ice for industrial purposes to chill brewery tanks or refrigerate meat and other perishables. There was no element of the process to maintain purity of water so that the resulting ice would be potable. Diesel recognized the market, the market need for table ice at restaurants and in the home. Ice pure enough to put in a drink. In a year, Diesel earned his first patent. On September 24, 1881, France issued the patent for Carafus Frapes Transparentus, <laughs> bottled clear ice. A month later came his French patent for potable ice and blocks, seemingly incongruous, the incongruous the future inventor of the diesel engine also invented the ice cube. So there's a good trivia question for you there. Who invented the ice cube? And Diesel, he, he continued his day job. He worked for this gentleman for quite a while. And the gentleman was a mentor. But it was interesting. One of the other things that this book talks about a lot is patents. And uh, again, I'm not an inventor. I haven't been involved too much with that. Uh, but uh, the patents were by country, and this gentleman that he worked for, the patents that were developed under his auspices were his. So even though Diesel got that patent, he couldn't really benefit from it because it belonged really to somebody else. But that was his invention. He then worked, and I'm not going to tell the story so much of his, uh, of the diesel engine and so on. But uh, he was a brilliant mind, and uh, he's associated with a number of companies, uh, some in Augsburg. In 1883, Diesel married Martha Flasch, continued to work for Lind, gaining numerous patents in both Germany and France. He would have three children. 
Because he was not allowed to use his patents developed under Lind for his own purposes, he began to expand his efforts into steam engines and the creation of the diesel engine in 1897. Now, he developed a relationship, well, not a relationship, but as I mentioned in the book, they talk a lot about John D. Rockefeller and the development of the Rockefeller fortune in oil. And of course, the diesel engine reduced the consumption of oil considerably. And that was another reason it was of interest to Kaiser Wilhelm, because they could develop the battleships and not depend on oil, and therefore be a little more independent. Because of the success of the diesel engine, and it was tremendously successful, the, one of the theories about diesel's disappearance is that ruthless cur, John D. Rockefeller, <laughs> rubbed him out. Another suspicion is that Kaiser Wilhelm had him eliminated. So those were theories around the disappearance of Rudolf Diesel. In 1912, Diesel came to the United States. He and his wife were supposed to be on the Titanic, but they, uh, they didn't ride on that ship. And uh, they were close with Adolphus Bush, Anheuser Bush, and Bush invested heavily in diesel engines and so on. And he, Diesel, visited him in St. Louis and he gave talks in St. Louis. And I have to share with you his, uh, Diesel's comments about Americans and his wife's comments. After sharing his opinion that America had already become the world's leading power and that America's industrial financial supremacy would continue to grow, uh, Diesel was asked, what do you like most about America, about Americans? And Diesel answered, there are four American virtues which I believe basic. First, I would name the absence of any durably fixed classes. Your poor and rich, laboring and professional classes are quite readily interchangeable. Next, I would say that the distribution of intelligence and charity among everyday Americans is very fair and generous. My third point is great respect for American invented talents also exceptionally and well distributed among all kinds of workers. As I sit here and talk about that, I uh, uh, think of uh, uh, Kay Newberry and her recently departed husband who had over about 300 patents with Tornado. And uh, we would have somebody here to talk about patents. And finally, the modesty of important Americans. This was before Trump. Modesty of important Americans, uh, people invites more of its kind. And then they had his wife. <laughs> Martha wasn't spared a blitz of press either. She handled the incoming questions with grace and discretion that bordered on the comedian. When asked for her views on women's suffrage, she replied, it is an interesting development. <laughs> When asked for her views on Teddy Roosevelt, who was then fracturing the Republican Party in another run for the president, she answered, he is an interesting development. <laughs> her views on the growth of the Lutheran Church in America. Lutheranism is always an interesting development. <laughs> so this was 1912. Then they went back home and uh, Diesel was going to make another trip. And uh, I'm reading this because th th they put this in such a good way. He was preparing for a trip to England to do some business. And before he left, he stayed with his, his son and daughter-in-law. And it says, during his last days in Frankfurt, Rudolph had gone shopping for his wife. He purchased an elegant leather overnight bag 
as a parting present and had it wrapped. He gave the gift to Martha with the instruction that she should not unwrap it until the following week. Rudolf, Rudolf also gifted uninscribed copies of his just published book to his son and daughter-in-law. The inscription had a strange tone. My beloved son, this book contains only the bare, clear, technical side of my life's work, the skeleton. Perhaps sometime you can mold on this skeleton the living body through the addition of the genuine hum humaneness that you perhaps more than anyone else have witnessed and knew with understanding, your father. Mm -hmm. The inscription for Martha's was, my wife, you were everything to me in this world, for you alone have I lived and struggled. If you leave me, then I want to be no more. Now then he went to Antwerp, and he boarded the Dresden. And that night he had dinner and uh, uh, with friends, and they enjoyed themselves and everything. And at about 10 o'clock, he left and went to his room. The next morning, they were to meet for breakfast, and Rudolph did not show up. Where was Rudolph? They looked in his stateroom. In Diesel's stateroom, his key ring still hung from the lock of his suitcase. His steel-cased pocket watch still rested on a side table where it could be seen from the bed. His enameled pillbox, his eyeglasses case, coin purse, and penknife were nowhere to be found. Diesel's notebook was turned open on the desktop. The page was empty except where he had penciled the date, September 29th, 1913. And below the date, he had drawn a cross. His bed had not been slept in. What happened to the office? Now, his friends didn't know they did find on the deck, a folded coat with a hat on it. But no real reason. The crewman said that he had seen, before the ship departed, they, they got on the ship and it was quite a while before it departed, he had seen Diesel leave the ship to go off the ship before it departed, but never saw him come back. Well, that conflicts with the folks that had dinner with him. Uh, apparently, there is a register. There was a register found, and his name was not on the register. So, the question then becomes: Was he on the ship, and the story of the meal and everything was fabricated? What 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 is the story? Uh, we don't know. And interestingly, this gentleman comes up with another theory which I can't tell you <laughs> because I get a commission on the sale of these books <laughs> and we want them to sell. But it's a very interesting theory. The reviewers of the book have given it high praise. As I said, it, it is an interesting read because it, you learn a great deal. Uh, and it's an interesting theory. Diesel. Uh, I did. I wanted to share one the significance of Diesel. Uh, if I can, one of the, uh, just to give you an idea. Again, not being that kind of person. Uh, excuse my disorganization here. I had it handy. Renowned scholar Vaclav Spiel published his book, Prime Movers of Globalization, The History and Impact of Diesel Engines and Gas Turbines in 2010. He identifies diesel's engine for shipping and rail and Frank White's gas turbine jet for jet airplanes as the two inventions responsible for the modern global economy. 
As of 2010, diesel engines operating under the same basic principle as Rudolph's 1897 engine powered 94% of shipping around the world. So Rudolph Diesel is truly significant. Died at age 55 uh, with no apparent explanation. So that's a mysterious case to read off these. I, boy, I have a bunch of questions. Um, <laughs> first off, I've heard of a diesel engine and you know diesel fuel and whatever before, but never this person whatever. Really didn't know what to expect from this review, but I knew I would enjoy what you did. Um, but right from the get go. Did you say in the prologue that they found a body floating and they threw the corpse back? But well, I'm glad you lifted that up because that was extremely unusual. Especially if there are headlines and all the papers. Well, and, 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 and that's what's part of it. That is it. They lift that up here. That at, at time to discover a body, usually the body was saved, was pulled in. Right. His was not. So his, there's no record of his body. That's a good question. Yeah, for, I mean, for a second. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so uh, again, I mean, there's, I, 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 a lot of the book, as I said, technical. That's the story. So you learn about his life. He was, as I say, he's brilliant. There's a nice story about his his development of the engine and the experimenting on the engine. Uh, and uh, there was one time when an explosion occurred. And unfortunately, he wasn't close enough to get hurt. Uh, but they had the trials and errors to develop the engine, and he was continually working. Uh, and uh, the competition between the British and the Germans with regard to the Navy, Kaiser Wilhelm, of course, the British had a huge navy. Their philosophy of their navy was that it should be larger than the combined navies of any two other nations. And Winston Churchill, was First Lord of the Admiralty at the time of Diesel. And he and Diesel developed a relationship. The, the British built a huge battleship called the Dreadnought, and uh, it was remarkable. Uh, and they were using diesel engines, which of course the Kaiser was upset with. Uh, and he was ordering that his fleet be built. Uh, and it goes into the rivalry and the competition and the admirals and so on. So that's, that's a neat story, uh, but it all revolves around the engine and Diesel's mind. And so there are motives, there are motives to get rid of him with Wilhelm and Rockefeller. There's motives to protect him with regard to Winston Churchill. So what happened to him? Was he killed? Did he die? Did he commit suicide? There were rumors that he was going broke. By the way, the package that he left his wife that she opened after he died had 20,000 marks, dollars in it. He left her a lot of money. Um, as if, again, the planning, it seemed like the planning was to leave. He left her money. He left work for his son to develop his, his story. Um, how old was he? 55. Yeah. And he was in relatively good health. There was no indications that he was... I hate to be racist, but what do we know about his ethnicity? Um, his what? His ethnicity? He was German. Okay. Yeah, he was, they were um, German. His father was a businessman, but they had moved to Paris, and he was born in Paris, but the parents were Bavarian. And uh, he went and he grew up in Augsburg. When he went to live with his uncle, he was brilliant. He went to school uh, in Augsburg, and he was like the top of his class, and so on. And, uh, he was just a brilliant guy, and he made he made developed relationships with uh, manufacturers in Bavaria. And his first development with the engine and so on were there. And he had some business relationships. He met Einstein, uh, and Einstein, I didn't say the quote, but Einstein considered him one of the most brilliant men there were. Apparently, Diesel didn't have his Great an impression of Einstein as Einstein had. <laughs> yeah. and, and see, that's where my brain was going. I'm thinking. And he knew uh, about all of those. He was contemporaries of all of those guys, brilliant minds, and so on. And uh, he was extremely rich. So the, the theory that 
the theory that he was debt ridden, even if he was in debt and losing money, the potential for growth was so significant that he really didn't have to take himself out because of that. But he did leave his wife money. Were there investors in his? The, the, uh, the business arrangements were such that I think he, he got, like, say, Bush, Anheuser Bush, they controlled everything and then he had shares. That's the way it worked. And it's not like he owned, the, he had shares. As they developed in different countries, he had shares. So, yes? Did he have the capital? Where did he have that capital? On the ice cube? No, on the beach. No, that was his patent. It was his yeah, patent. He, yeah, he developed that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I looked up, I never did find the total number of patents. I was looking for that, and I didn't find it. But, but he was continually working, and he wanted to make the most efficient kind of engine. And, but he, he could. and uh, he changed it to naval power and so on. Yeah. Any other attempts on his life? As he was developing, no, 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 no. just his disappearance, <laughs> suicide, accident, murder, or is there another story? <laughs> I absolutely do. Give it a second. It could be in the last chapter. I absolutely do. I didn't identify the body. Yeah. Well, that's it. See, with no body. And what were the four items of plant? For the four items of plant. So nobody went back to look for the body. No, no it, was, uh, it was pretty well. From what they said, it was pretty well decomposed anyway. Yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why they didn't retain it. No, well, could be. Yeah. But the custom was to keep the body, so it's unusual that they did not. That's the unusual thing. Mm -hmm. I just want to mention two other books. Um, one was Einstein's Wife by Marie Benedict that it gave me a whole different idea of Einstein. Yes. <laughs> it is a fictionalized account of a real person. Um, and another one that I just not too long ago found in the new book section that doesn't have anything to do with this, but I just found fascinating was Generations by Jean Twenge, I, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but T-W-E-N-G-E. -E. And it starts with the silent generation, which is me, <laughs> and she really got it. And then she described each generation since what happens in the world and politics and history mm -hmm. um, and how it affects that generation and how that generation is brought up and that generation's changes in marriage, parenthood, everything you can think of. And I found it just, oh, I'm comparing it to people I know. And of course she says, this is all across a broad range of individuals. You can't apply this to individuals. But I found it so fascinating. Another book fast. that I'm reading that just came out for those that are interested in history and presidents and so on is Life After Power. And it's about seven presidents and what they did after they were in office. Uh, the first chapter is on Thomas Jefferson, which is remarkable. And then the second one is John Quincy Adams. And I'm in the third with Grover Cleveland. Who at age 49 married his 21 year old wife mm -hmm. and while he was in the White House. Uh, but uh, interesting stories because of the role of former <coughs> presidents as we see it today. So thank you. I don't want to keep you too long. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tim. It was very interesting.
Yeah, I I'm just want to remind people that next Friday yeah. we have yeah. another book sandwiched in. And the book title is All the Little Hopes by Leo Weiss. And it will be reviewed by Maureen Niccolo. And um, that's going to be here. And then on March 22nd, Memory Wars, Settlers and Natives Remember Washington Sullivan's Expedition of 1779 by A. Lynn Smith, reviewed by Gary Emerson. And I was given some information uh, just a little bit ago. Uh, there are free tickets to a concert at the Clemens Center. The concert date is Saturday, April 13th at 2 o'clock. And all you have to do is go to the con to the Clemens Center and ask for the free tickets. And you can get four, a total of four tickets. And it's the Army Jazz Band. And uh, you can do that either in person at the Clemens Center or you can do it online. Or well, right now at the Clemens Center. Right now? Pick it up. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. I have a list of our uh, books sandwiched in right here on the edge of the table. Pick up a copy if you'd like.